Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. So we have some questions that the youth they have put forward and in the masjid telegram group it was made available uh, an opportunity for them to uh, ask questions anonymously there's a, a form that's available that was available which uh, is a, a very beneficial uh, means in reality may Allah reward the brothers who helped establish that that was made available for them to ask questions without uh, exposing uh, anyone's name or identity and that way one can feel free to ask whatever they need uh, and whatever uh, they uh, desire without worrying about being exposed and the likes like this which is uh, inshallah is beneficial so these questions that we have they are presented from uh, our youth and uh, there were 56 questions so there were a lot of them so we we'll try to answer as many uh, as I can, inshallah, in the time that we have, and without keeping everyone too late. Some of them, uh, I will put them all together and answer them at one time in order to uh, save time. Also, many of them, they're, they're, they're similar. So those that are like that, yani, uh, they will be like this. So I'll try to read as much as I can from them, but if your question is not read specifically, maybe... Your question is uh, included uh, in, in, uh, in the answer of another question, and this is my point. So, so many of the questions they'll be uh, answered in, in, at one time. At one time, we understand this point here. Okay, so we begin. Uh, some of the first questions they mentioned uh, was with regards to salah, and uh, the question says if a person misses uh, some rakah with the imam, and the imam made a mistake. When the imam makes sujood sahu, does he do it with him or at the end of his salat? Or at the end of his salat? Somebody who came late to the prayer and he has to make up a portion of the prayer, but the imam, he made a mistake and the imam is going to make sujood sahu. So the one who came late, what will he do? This is the question. So this uh, is according to the circumstance. And first, if the imam, he made sujood before before taslim, then it's an obligation for the person praying to make sujood with the imam. Then it's an obligation for the person to make sujood with the imam. We understand that if the imam, if a person came late and their imam is about to make salam, but before that he made sujood sahu, and then he made salam, it's an obligation here to make the sujood with him. It's an obligation to follow him in the prayer and make the sujood with him. And then after that, he does not have to make sujood again. And then after that, he does not have to make sujood again. One time only, this is sufficient. Now I'm that person. So the person who, who pray with the imam, the imam, he made sujood as-sahu. Before salam, the one praying behind him will make sujood as-sahu along with him. When the imam makes salam, he will stand up. He will finish his prayer, and that's it. He will stand up and finish his prayer, and that's it. And uh, as for the circumstance, if the imam, he makes sujood as-sahu, after the salam, if he makes sujood as sahu after the salam, then uh, the person praying behind him who came late, he will not make sujood with the imam. Rather, the imam, whenever he makes salam, he will stand up. And whenever the imam makes salam, the man behind him and the person behind him will stand up and he will finish the prayer and then he will make sujood as sahu at the end of his prayer in this manner like this. We understand? This is the answer. But uh, one point should be known that if, uh, uh, if the imam, for example, he made salam, and then he made sujood as sahu after the salam, the person, if he stood up already, he should not go down. You understand that? He should not go back down and make sujood. He just keeps going. That's the point. That's the, the point. He, he stands up, the one who prayed behind the imam, he stands up and he keeps going. He will not stand up and then go back down if the imam made sujood. We understand that? The imam, for example, he made salam. The, the brother stood up to finish his prayer. 
And then the imam makes you do the sahu. It's not allowed for him to go back down. It's not allowed for him to go back down and make sujood. Rather, he just com com completes his prayer and he makes sujood in the end. He makes sujood in the end. So if the imam, he makes sujood before the salam, the ma'mum, he will make sujood with the imam and that's it. And he's finished. He doesn't have to make sujood as sahu again. And if the imam, he makes sujood after the salam, then the ma'mum, he will not make sujood with the imam. Rather, he will stand up and he will finish his prayer and make sujood as sahu in the end of his prayer. And, uh, and Allah knows best. The next question, is it obligatory to connect the feet in Salah or is it Sunnah? Or is it Sunnah? The same question came last time in our questions with, with, with the youth. The same question came last time on our question with the youth. And those questions are recorded. So if this uh, person is a brother, he can come after class and we'll direct him to the, to the answer in the recording. And if it's a sister, then he can go to the sister's side. She can go to the sister's side and those sisters who are teachers there can direct them to the answer so that we can save time. It says, why isn't Taraweeh prayed in Tawheed? I said, I don't know about this question. Uh, I think this is uh, a mistake because Taraweeh is always prayed in Tawheed. Correct? Alhamdulillah. Then it says, why is there no Tahajjud? So now the second question, why is there no Tahajjud? So maybe they meant to say that the first time. I, I don't know. Allah knows best. The Taraweeh can be prayed both ways. So either way, they can pray in the beginning of that night. It suffice with that. Or in the last 10 nights, they can pray in the beginning and then take a break and pray again later if they like. Either way, it's both allowed and good. So there's, there's no need to say, why don't they do this one? And maybe if they did that one, somebody say, well, why don't they do this one? So all of it is allowed, alhamdulillah. And if the administration chooses to follow one way, then it's all good. So long as the, the way they choose is from the sunnah which is the case here. So this is any, something that, it, that is allowed. So if we choose to finish the prayer in the beginning of the night, Alhamdulillah, this is allowed. If we choose to uh, pray some and then delay and come back and pray later after taking a break, this is also allowed. This is also allowed. So the next question, it says, if I am praying at home, do my siblings have to cover their hairs with hijab? If I'm praying at home, do my siblings have to cover their hairs with with hijab, this is uh, uh, according to the age of them. If they are of the age of puberty, then yes, they must. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, inna allaha la yakhbaru salati ha'idhin illa bi khimar. That verily Allah, he does not accept the prayer of a uh, woman who has reached the age of puberty, except that she's covered properly, except with the khimar, except that she's covered properly. So if she's of the age of puberty, then yes, she must cover with the hijab entirely. But if she's under the age of puberty and at the age of tamiz, yani or over the age of seven approximately, but lesser than the age of puberty, then no, she doesn't have to wear the hijab and the prayer will be accepted. But it's better for her and she should be taught that and she should be uh, requested and directed to wear the hijab and to not pray except in it. But if it happened that she prayed without the hijab, then the prayer is accepted. This is for the, uh, the girl who is under the age of puberty. Under the age of puberty. Yeah, but she's of the age of Tamiz. But she's of the age of Tamiz. Because the condition for the prayer to be accepted is that she's at the age of Tamiz. Approximately seven years old. So seven, eight, nine, until she reaches puberty before that, then uh, it's not an obligation to cover the hair and the salat. But we should teach them and encourage them. And they should have honor and respect and learn that from the very beginning that she shouldn't come to the prayer without covering properly, even if she's at the age of tamiz, even if she's under the age of puberty. But if she prayed that way, it would be accepted. It would be accepted, you understand that? So what do we teach them? We teach them they should wear it. That way they're cultivated upon that way. That way they, they, they learn this and they become accustomed to that. But for example, if it happened, one of them just come to the prayer and they prayed like that, uh, then it's, uh, it's not... Uh, it's not wrong, and the prayer is accepted, and, and Allah knows best. And Allah knows, uh, and Allah knows best. There was uh, another question. They said, is pranking people haram? Is pranking people haram? For example, going behind them and scaring them, or pouring water on them when they are sleeping. Is this haram? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has been given complete guidance. And this is from the most amazing and also beautiful affairs of Al-Islam. 
and the clarification of his perfection. And that uh, the revelation had come uh, and he directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, many times the way that it would come is according to events that would occur. And uh, the person who learns the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he is familiar with the hadith of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will see complete and perfect guidance in every aspect of life. In every aspect of life. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he even discussed this issue here directly. And this is because of an event that happened in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were traveling. This hadith is in Sunan Nabi Dawood, and likewise in Al-Musnad by Imam uh, Ahmed. That they were traveling, and there was a man who fell asleep, and he had a rope along with him. So some of them, they went to him while he's sleeping and took his rope. Some of the people of knowledge mentioned that what that means, he took the rope from him, and he startled him. Others, they took, said maybe he took, they took the rope and like did something with it to him. In any case, the man, he woke up startled. So they, they, they're, they're, choking, they're joking with him. The man is sleeping, he has a rope with him. So some of the people went to him and they took the rope and did something and startled him while he's, while, he, while he's sleeping and scared him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not allow that. And he said, That it's not allowed for a Muslim to scare another Muslim. It's not allowed for a Muslim to scare another Muslim. So to go behind somebody and to scare them, this is not allowed. Or to go to somebody whenever they're sleeping and do something and scare them. This is not allowed. This is not allowed. This is haram. La yihillu. La yihillu yani annuhu haram. It's not allowed. Meaning it's haram. It's not halal. It's not halal for a Muslim to scare another Muslim. To frighten him. To startle him. You understand that? It's not allowed. This is haram. So this is not a good way. This is not a good way. We should not, we should not do that. We should not do that. This is not allowed. Rather it is... It is haram to go behind them and scare them or to hide around the corner and then jump out and frighten them and startle them or to say something to them and the likes like this or to, for example, to take their, their property and hide it and make them think that they lost it. Sometimes someone will take a bag and put their bag and they hide it somewhere or take their phone and put their phone somewhere and hide it from them till they think that it's lost and they're looking around for it and they become stressed. Where's my items? Where are my property? Did somebody take it? What happened like this? And entering this uh, fear in their heart, this is not allowed. The hearts of the believers, they have a great sacred right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not allowed to harm them or to scare them or to frighten them or, or to startle them or to startle them. We understand this portion? Alhamdulillah. Another question they say, what is the aura of the men? And what is your advice to the youth who play sports without shirts? The people of knowledge, they clarify that the aura of the, of the male is from the navel to the knees. From the navel to the knees. So they clarify likewise that the navel is not from the aura and nor are the knees. But that is which between that. That which is between the navels. From underneath the belly button until the knees. This is the aura. This is the aura. So this must be covered. It's not allowed to expose that. So the thighs, they're from the aura. Out of the best opinion. There's a hadith. Al-fakhidhu min al-awra. Al-fakhidhu min al-awra. That the thighs are from the aura. So it's not allowed for a man to walk around... Uh, with his aura showing Not in his house and not outside of his house especially Not even in his own home He would not walk around with his aura showing He would not walk around and his children Looking at his aura And, he, and the lights like this yani Just normally just normally. Rather whenever he's moving through his house And the lights like this He'll cover his aura So the aura is between the navel and, and the knees Between the navels and the knees Even more rifle he would not come out of his home and many of the disbelievers today from the new fad and the new way that's popular is for them to walk around with short shorts on. This is a foul way. This is a foul way. Do not be deceived by it. This is, this is haram and not allowed. It's haram and not allowed in the origin and even more severe because now they do it imitating the kuffar. How we understand that? In the origin, it's not allowed to wear shorts outside of the house, to wear shorts that are shorter than the knee. The shorts, they need to at least come to the knee. The people of knowledge, they mention it's better for it to go below the knee. That way it's safe. Because the only way to truly cover the aura is to pass the aura. Huh? The only way for the, the aura to be covered properly is for it to go past the aura sum. If not, if you just put it right to the limit of the aura, then it will come uncovered easily. It will come uncovered easily. And we have discussed the issue and the class is about the shame of uh, exposing one's aura. So we will not do this. So those pants and those shorts that are short 
and uh, exposing one's thighs from the brothers, this is not allowed. This is not proper. This is shameful. This is bad. It's not good. I know that many of the brothers, they, they do that. They do that. They walk around with uh, short, shorts on. It became a, po a popular thing to do these days. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is shameful. This is bad. This is no good. This is exposing one's aura and the likes like this. We understand that. This is not good. Do not do that. Barakallah fikum. Cover your aura. Have shyness. Have shyness. So what do we say about the one who plays sports without shirts on? We say that if, they're, uh, if they have pants that cover the, their aura, then it's allowed. If they have pants on, they have shorts on, for example, that cover their aura, they have below their navel uh, and their knees covered, then this is what's obligatory. And if they had their shoulders uncovered and their chest uncovered, then this is not haram, nor is it any impermissible. So this is allowed any, in general. But a, a person, he will uh, be shy and he will not just simply expose himself. And if any, in doing that, he's going to lead him to becoming exposed, and he will avoid that. He will avoid that. So it's better to, uh, to, to, to not uh, put yourself in a situation where you can uh, expose your aura. So in order for the aura to be covered, you have to have your garment above your navel. Because that which is below the navel is from the aura. And you have to have your garment below your knees, because that which is above the knees is is the aura, is the aura. So we should not take it lightly. We should not look at the disbelievers and, uh, and follow their way, and follow their way. After this, they say there seems to be a trend growing uh, for, for, for the boys, growing their hair. The, some of the, the boys grow their hair, letting their hair grow long. And uh, whenever they are asked about that, their excuse is that the Prophet wasallam grew his hair. It's mentioned here, some of them even put their hair in ponytails. Some of them even put their hair in ponytails. And others, they even go so far because of their hair being so long, they buy women's hair products and they put it in their, in their hair. And they put it in their hair. Another question likewise about this, is it allowed for men to braid their hair? They say if they're not copying the kufar. For example, if I want to grow out my hair. If I want to grow out my hair. So first of all, we see here that uh, the issue of the hair, the people of Nala, as they mentioned, that this is not from the, the actions uh, of the Prophet wasallam that one will follow as an action of worship. That any, having the hair in a certain way is not uh, from those actions that is legislated to follow the Prophet wasallam and say, I have my hair like this because it's the Sunnah, or I have my hair like that because it's the Sunnah. The Prophet wasallam he had his hair Yani, according to the custom of his people. And at one time his hair will be uh, long to his shoulders, and other times it will be between his shoulders and his ears, and other times, sallallahu alayhi wa it will be at his ears, and other times it will be shaven completely. And other times it will be shaven completely. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not encourage the Muslims to have their hair in a certain way. Rather, he was just uh, observing the custom of the people uh, in his time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one thing. And then uh, another thing that we see here, some of those people, they say that uh, the reason why they have their hair, and he's using this as an excuse because they want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But um, many times, yani shaitan, he will deceive people and he will trick them and they will make excuses. But uh, from their actions, it's clear that they're not being honest and they're not being truthful. And in reality, they're following their desires. So we have to be very cautious from following our desires. We have to be very cautious from following our whims, doing what we like to do, and what we want to do. And even more severe than that is to do whatever somebody wants to do and then look for some type of hadith to support that. Or look for some type of evidence or statement of a scholar to support that. And in reality, a person, they just wanna follow their desires. In reality, some people, they just wanna have long hair. So then they'll look around and they'll say, oh, oh, the prophet had long hair. So in one narration, he had long hair. But if you really want to follow the Prophet, the Prophet wasallam also, he did not wear those tight pants that those people with long hair have. Huh? He didn't have tight pants on either. So, so if you want to follow the Prophet, why don't you follow him and wear the pants properly that are wide and that are baggy, that are loose. Huh? The Prophet wasallam used to wear a thobe. 
He used to love to wear the kameez. Um Salama, radiallahu anha, she said the most beloved garment to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the kameez. A thobe like this one. The people of Nala, as they say, لِأَنَّهُ astar لَلْبَدَنْ Because it covers the private parts better. It's more, it covers more the private parts. The one who has a thobe on like this, inshallah, his privates won't come uncovered. Inshallah, his privates won't come uncovered. If he had an izah on, maybe it will come loose. If he had a top on, maybe it will fall down. But as for this one, you put it on and it covers your whole body. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to like that. He used to like that. Likewise, yani the, 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 the garments that uh, some of them wear, they want to have their hair in this way. And then they want to say it's the sunnah. But then whenever you look at them, they walk like the disbelievers. And they act like the disbelievers. So, and then we look at the people who have their hair like that now, and we say, that's the disbelievers. So in reality, are we wanting to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are we wanting to follow the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My advice is to be truthful here. My advice is to be truthful here. And to, to really be truthful with yourself. And to know that Allah, He knows what's in your heart. That Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah, he, he looks to your hearts. And He looks into your intentions. So if somebody is following his desires and he's tried with sins, that's one thing. But to try to blame that on the religion or to find a way out and ascribe that to the deen of Allah, this is another thing. This is even more dangerous. This is even more dangerous. So if somebody was going to uh, say something like growing his hair because the Prophet Wasallam did that, then he should also and he do that which is more rightful. He should pray like the Prophet Wasallam, and he should have manners like the Prophet Wasallam, and he should have his clothing like the Prophet Wasallam. The Prophet, he forbade having his pants below the ankles. Many of them, they want to grow their hair. Oh, it's because of the sunnah. But he drags his pants. But he drags his pants. This is all indications he's not truthful. And it's claimed that he wants to follow the sunnah. We understand that. We understand that. This is very important. We, we can't uh, play like this. Then also on top of that, the people of God, as they mentioned, and from them, uh, Ibn Abdul Bar. Ibn Abdul Bar, he died in the year uh, 463. He has a great book and explanation of the Muwatta, of Imam Malik. And uh, he is from the great scholars of Hadith, and he, who have uh, explained the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu He mentioned in his time that many, uh, many people started having what is called a Jumma. A Jumma is a type of hairstyle the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. Even as mentioned in the Shema'il and Nabawiyah, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kana alim al Jumma. He had a big Jumma, meaning his hair would be long, coming down almost to his shoulders, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one of the descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Abdul Barr, he said in his time and in his era, many people started having the Jumma, but those people, they were all Sufaha. Those were all the foolish and the wicked and the evil people. So the people of knowledge and the people of virtue, they turned away from that hairstyle. Although originally the Prophet ﷺ had that type of hairstyle. But whenever the foolish and whenever the evil and the wicked people, whenever the bad people and the corrupted people, they had started having that hairstyle and it became known as their way, then the people of knowledge, they avoided that and they stayed away from that. So the, with regards to the hairstyle, this goes back to the customs of the people. This goes back to the customs of the people. A person will have his hair, yani what is normal in the customs of the people. But even if a person wanted to have his hair a certain way, but it's known in the customs of those people that that's the way of the foolish, that's the way of the wicked, that's the way of the sinners, that's the way of the rappers, that's the way of the gang bangers, that's the way of the drug dealers, that's the way of the drug users, like this. Their hairs are like that, now you should not do that. Because now you, the, the people are going to look at him and say, oh, he looks like those guys. He looks like those guys, like this. So, so somebody who has his hair like that, their hairstyle is known to be a certain way now. Even if it was close to something like the Prophet ﷺ had. But now it's known for those bad people to do that. He would not be allowed to do that anymore. And one, he should not do that because now he's imitating those people. And even worse, if in reality he's imitating those people in, in his heart. Why does he want to have his hair like that? Why does he want to have his pants like that? Why does he want to do that? Because he's seen those guys doing that. Many times this is the case. Many times this is the case. So even if it was from the, the way of the Prophet ﷺ, what is known now is that these bad people, that's how they do their hair. One, he will not do his hair like that. One, he will not do his hair like that. Huh? He would be different from those people that are known to have the bad hair way. And he, for example, they're talking about, can I have braids? Somebody may say, oh, well, the Prophet ﷺ had braids. Okay, what kind of braids did he have, ﷺ? Do we know? 
Huh? What did they call him here? Corn rolls? Did he have that? No, he had, it's mentioned that he had four braids coming out. And it's mentioned that this is not something that he had or that he was seen with sallallahu alayhi wa all the time, but rather he was traveling. And whenever he entered Mecca, he was seen to have these four braids in his hair. The people of Nala, as I mentioned, that this is because of him traveling. And this is because you know, he's going a long time without being able to shower or take care of his hair and the likes like this. This was not a custom that he did daily. This is not a custom that he kept it like that all the time. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then it goes back again to the customs. So if we see around here that the people who are drug addicts or drug dealers or rap stars, they're the ones who have their hair braided. Then a believer, he would not want to have his hair braided like them. He would not want to have it, even if they braided their hair exactly the same way. He would not, it's become a custom now. It become a custom now that these filthy and these disgusting and these evil people, they have their hair like that. So if a person, he had his hair like that, then the people in the community, they'll be like, oh, he's from those filthy and disgusting people who do that. You understand that? Because now he looks like them. Now he looks like them. Is this clear? Who does he look like? Who's, who does he look? He looks like the rappers. Who's he, he's got his hair like this, and then he, he, he looks like, if you look on the TV, or if you look on the YouTube, and you look at this rap star, and that rap star, and this famous guy, and that famous guy, and like that from the, from the kufar, from the disbelievers, those people who have foul tongues, and foul mouth, and foul lifestyles, you'll find they have their hair like that. And they, ha and they have that style like that. So whenever the people see the person like that, he say, oh, he's like them. He's like them. You understand? And then he tried to say, oh, no, 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 I'm following Prophet Muhammad. No, you're not. You're following those, those evil people. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. It's very clear who, who, who's following who. It's very clear who's following who. Sometimes maybe the youth, they say, oh, uh, brother Abu Abdurrahman, you don't know what we're going through. But I, I, I tell you that uh, I, I lived in this community, in, in, in this society, excuse me, in America. And the majority of my life, I was not a Muslim. The majority of my life, I was not a Muslim. So I know what it's like to be a disbeliever. I know what it's like to, to live in disbelief. I know what it's like to, 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 to follow those people and to be from those people and to act like those people. I know what it's like. I used to do that. I used to do that. Before I was a Muslim, I was tried by the likes of these things. And Allah saved me from that, alhamdulillah. So the street life and these things, I experienced that. I, I know about that. I lived that. So I know what it's like to want to imitate them or to be like to the rap star or, or the, or the Jay-Z guy or the, whoever else is popular, all of these type of things. This is something that, uh, alhamdulillah, me, myself, I was involved in Allah saved me from that. So whenever I speak to you about these things, I'm telling you from my own experience. So somebody who tasted something, he knows about those affairs. He has insight about those affairs. So whenever I mention the likes of, of this stuff, things that the youth are facing, the, the, the things that they're facing from uh, trials with drugs or trials with, uh, with uh, girlfriends or trials with these affairs and that affair. These are things that I experienced myself. So I'm speaking to you from experience. And now I'm telling you as your brother. And he said, so do not try to, to, to fool yourself. Do not try to fool yourself. So do not say, I want to have braids because the Prophet ﷺ had braids. La, them guys on Rap City got braids. That's why. That's why. So be sincere. And be truthful. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't really have braids like that. It's something that maybe one narration he's mentioned when he's traveling. And he the likes like this. And even if somebody really wanted to follow the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he wouldn't begin with braids. He wouldn't begin with braids. Where would he begin? Huh? If you're going to do the braids, you're going to do the garments. Right? Uh, and we know about the garment and, his, and, and your manners and your conduct. And with the greatest thing the Prophet ﷺ, he was upon was the salat. How, where's the salat at? Many of them, they want to have braids, but they don't even care about salat. Maybe they, even, they didn't get up for fajr. Or their father has to like pull them out of bed for fajr. So this is you know, something that we should be aware of and we shouldn't deceive ourselves and we shouldn't try to use the religion as an excuse to follow our desires. To follow our desires. We should be truthful. We should be truthful with Allah. If we have some fault, if we have some trials or some sins, we say, I have sins. May Allah forgive me. Inshallah, Allah will forgive this person. But as for saying, Yanni, that I'm following my desires, and, but I claim that it's because I'm following the Sunnah, this is different. This is a big problem. You understand the difference between the two? And one person, he knows he's a sinner, he has mistakes, Yanni, inshallah, he will repent, and Allah will accept that and guide him. As for the one who tries to blame his desires and use the religion as a proof for him, and he, this one, he's not going to uh, many times be guided, and he, trying to go to that extent following the desires. Following the desires. So we should, uh, again, be truthful 
uh, in our faith and uh, follow our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam honestly, honestly and truthfully, not just in what our desires like or what our desires want. So they say, is a man that is not married allowed to wear a ring? Is a man that is not married allowed to wear a ring? Um, I think this question is coming from some uh, other misguided understanding uh, of wearing rings and also from imitating the Christians in the society. And that is that uh, the Christians in this society, whenever one gets married, he wears a ring. He wears a ring. And this is haram and this is not allowed. And this is not allowed for more than one aspect. From the first aspect is that's imitating the kuffar and imitating the Christians. And the second aspect is from creed. Because from their creed, they believe that that, that ring, is, so long as they're wearing that ring, that their marriage will continue. Even to the extent that if one of them takes it off, he has bad omen and he has bad thoughts. And he thinks that this is a sign uh, that their marriage will not last. Or even if one of them takes it off and the other one sees it took it off, he would, he would accuse him or he would accuse her and the likes like this. So they also have a creed along with that. Even if they didn't have the creed, even if they didn't have the creed, it's sufficient that this is the way of the Christians. When one of them gets married, he puts a ring on his finger, indicating the marriage. You understand that? This is not the way of the Muslims. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, didn't do that. So any, from this aspect, wearing a ring like this is not allowed. It's not allowed. But as for a man wearing a ring in general, if it's not, if it's not gold, it's allowed. It's allowed to wear a ring. And he married or not married? Married or not married? You're wearing a ring just to wear a ring. Huh? This is from the Mubahat, from that which is permissible and allowed. The people of Nana, as I mentioned, you wear it on the pinky. Many of the scholars of hadith, they mention in wearing it on the ring finger and the middle finger is disliked. They have narrations and the likes, and they mention what is preferred is to wear it on the pinky, and Allah knows best. And Allah knows best. But this is something that is allowed for a man who's married or not married to just simply wear a ring for no, no, no reason other than uh, adornment or other than a type of beautification and the likes like this. So long as it's not gold so long as it's not it's not gold and and Allah knows best they say how should I deal with stress when it comes to school how should I deal with stress when it comes to when it comes to school um, and also another one what is the way to deal with stress about the hereafter dealing with stress and dealing with the trials of life can only be uh, successful whenever a person has faith so in every situation uh, these hardships and difficulties they are faced and they are met and uh, counteracted with sincere faith. A believer, he must remember that he is a creation and that he is subjected to trials and tests and that this, li this life is a test. And uh, sometimes we're tested with good and sometimes we're tested with hardship. And in every circumstance, there is an action of servitude that's obligatory to perform because we're created for worship. We're created for worship. So that worship sometimes whenever is different uh, with regards to dealing with the trials of life. Whenever a person is faced with prosperity and, good, and goodness and health and wealth and the likes, then he is also tried and tested with that. And the, 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 the servitude and the obligatory worship here is to show thanks. It's to show thanks and to use those blessings and that prosperity and that health and that wealth and the pleasure of Allah and that which is allowed. And other times a person, he'll be tried with hardship and difficulty. And he'll be facing any tr troubles and calamities and stressful uh, events and the likes like this. And the type of worship that is obligatory now is to be patient and to know that these are from the decree of Allah. So here in the times uh, of good times and ease, then one he will show thanks and he will use those blessings and that which is allowed for him and permissible. And in times of hardship and difficulty, then he will be patient and he will uh, accept the decree of Allah and he will trust and rely upon Allah to help him and to save him and to protect him from the anger, that from the dangers that he's facing or from the stressful events that he's facing. And he will uh, take the means that are allowed for him likewise to lighten them, to lighten them. So therefore, it goes back to having faith. In this manner, the Prophet wasallam mentioned that his affair will be good at all times. So the only way to be good whenever there is uh, prosperity is to have faith and to be thankful. And the only way to be good whenever there is hardship and difficulty is to have faith and to be patient. So the one who realizes that the stress, the, the stress that one is facing and he in school or in worrying about the hereafter and the likes like this, all of this and he can only be removed by putting one's faith in Allah and by trusting Allah. If a person is stressed about the hereafter, then he should 
I repent to Allah. And he should try to be sincere and uh, obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leave off the sins. And the one who and he is truthful and does their best to fulfill the obligations and to avoid the prohibitions, then Allah, he will put happiness in their heart and contentment in their heart. And they will be able to deal with these affairs. And the one who is doing good and striving their best, then they have high hopes that their actions will be accepted. So therefore, the hereafter is something that they're looking forward to and they're making preparation for. So it's not something any that will stress them. Rather, there is something that they're preparing for. It's something that they're preparing for. Stress comes many times because of sins. Because of sins. A person, he will fall into sin. He will look at that which is not allowed for him. Or he'll have, relationship with, he'll have relationships that are not permissible. And all of this is reason for the heart to become sad. And for the heart to become stressed. And for problems to enter into the life. And for distress to come and worry to come. And for grief to come and sadness to come. And the way to remove all of that is only by obeying Allah. And being truthful in, in one's uh, religion and in one's worship. And striving to fear Allah in public and in private. And striving to fear Allah in public and in private. Here we say, how do we act towards the kuffar at school or workplaces? We just uh, try to avoid them as much as possible. Dealing with the kuffar in school or in workplaces. And if a person is forced to, to uh, interact with them, then he will try to minimize that as much as possible. And yeah, all the while being courteous and nice. All the while, he'll be courteous and nice. Yani he will not be rude, and he will not he will not be harsh. But at the same time, he will not uh, be uh, so friendly and courteous that he follows along behind them, or follows along beside them, and he uh, and, and, and partakes with them, and, and he's uh, yani being a companion and friend with them. La, he will be an acquaintance. His uh, his relationship will be brief, and he will avoid uh, being close to them or going into conversations deep with them. Unless it's about da'wah and calling to Allah, then that's something different. But just having these general relationships like this, a person, he will just keep a distant relationship. And if it's a, a, a worker you have to see, how are you doing, how is everything, how everything is good, okay, and you keep going and you go do your business. You go do your business. If somebody at, at school is forced to see him, you, you, how, how, how are you doing, how, everything is good, and you just go about your business. You don't, uh, keep a close relationship with the disbelievers. With the disbelievers. They're awliya, ba'aduhum li ba'ad. As for the believers, then they are awliya, ba'aduhum li ba'ad. So the believers, they are friends and companions and colleagues and allies one to another. And the disbelievers, they are like that to themselves as well. And if a person was hoping to find stress and problems and troubles in his life, then and he looked no further than befriending the disbelievers. Then look no further than befitting them. This is the straight, quick reason to find stress and problems and hardship and the likes like this. You need to find a bad life, to have bad companions. Bad companions lead to a bad life. And so the worst of the companions, those who are disbelievers, would have the billah. So to minimize that relationship as much as possible. And Allah knows best. Is it allowed to have a credit card if they intend to pay the full balance every month to avoid interest? For example, if I have the cash to pay the credit card bill before I even use the card, but want to leverage the credit card to build credit or gain points, or gain points. These credit cards, they have, uh, they have conditions you have to agree to. And those conditions is that you have to pay interest. You have to pay interest. There is a condition there before you can get a credit card. I'm not talking about a bank card, huh, where you use the bank, you use the money in your own account. To have, that's different, right? Uh, there's a difference between a bank card and a credit card. Everybody agree with me? Am I right? Okay, he's talking about what? A credit card. The credit card is when they give you a card and they say you got this much credit. You can spend as much as you like and then pay us back whenever you want to. Yeah, yeah, according to the, to, the, to the stipulations, according to the conditions. Uh, so the credit card contains a loan. The credit card is really a loan. They're going to loan you so much money. Huh? So the only way they loan you that money is if you, if, you, if you agree with them. And the agreement, you have to agree to pay interest. So this person is saying that, and he obviously it's clear, they intend to pay the full balance every month to avoid the interest. So here the fact that you have to agree to interest. You have to agree to the interest. You have to agree to interest. It's not allowed. It's not allowed to agree to interest because in, in agreeing to that is being pleased with that. In agreeing to that is being pleased with that. So therefore it's not allowed to take a credit card. It's not allowed to take a credit card because in the contract is interest. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, from the hadith of Jabr, 
لَأَنَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ آكِلَ الرِّبَةِ وَمُوكِ لَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He cursed the one who eats riba The one who takes it And the one who gives it And the one who signs for it Or writes it And the one who witnesses it And the ones who witnesses it So the issue of interest is very dangerous The issue of interest is very dangerous So one will not agree to pay interest Even if he has the intention to not pay it And he cannot agree That's a contract That somebody says Oh, you gotta pay If you don't pay You're gonna have to pay interest And then he's gonna say Yes, he agrees so this is affirming that he is a, he's, he's pleased with that. You understand that? It's not allowed. It's not allowed. This is not allowed. It's not allowed. And then they say, and this is shaitan. This is from those whispers of shaitan. What does he say? Oh, you need to build credit. Uh, you need to build your credit. Your credit with who? <laughs> huh? What does building credit mean? You want to have good standing, right? With some people. So you're going to sell your religion to have good standing with the people? Huh? You're going to sell your, your deen and earn the anger of Allah? Allah, He says, That if you do not give up the interest after you know it's haram, then have an announcement of war from Allah and His Messenger. So the issue of riba is nothing light at all. It's a war from Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa for the one who takes it. So we shouldn't... Uh, and he sell our religion like this in, in order to have good credit. If somebody really needs credit, then uh, there's other ways to get it. There's other ways to get it. Definitely will not sell his religion for it. He definitely will not disobey Allah for credit. Huh? Maybe he will disobey Allah and get the credit and he make the contract and never even get to use the card. He'll die. Huh? Some people he gonna get this, he's going to get this big credit card. He signs the credit card and on his way home he gets an erect. He doesn't even get to use it. Huh? What if this happened to somebody? And he completely sold his religion. Completely sold his deen. And this is not something light. It's not something light. So, no, you cannot take credit cards. It's not allowed in Islam. It's not allowed for a Muslim to, 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 to agree to interest or to sign to interest. Even if he didn't pay that. Even if he didn't pay that. Okay, now we see, they say, um, uh, is Quran more important than Hadith? Is Quran more important than Hadith? Uh, the Quran, no doubt, uh, has the, the highest virtue with regards to the, the revelation and uh, with regards to the legislation. And it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is the words of Allah. And the one who recites it, he has a reward. And, it, and it's uh, a requirement for the prayer to be correct That the Qur'an is recited That the Qur'an is recited So with regards to virtue No doubt the Qur'an has a higher status Than the Sunnah With regards to virtue With regards to virtue and nobility No doubt the Qur'an has a higher status than the Sunnah But with regards to establishing proof And establishing rulings And establishing halal and haram And permissible and impermissible Then the Qur'an is equal to the Sunnah. Then the Qur'an is equal to the Sunnah. The Qur'an is equal to the Sunnah. Rather, sometimes there will be rulings that are established in the Sunnah and not established in the Qur'an. And other times there are rulings in the Qur'an that are not clarified or understood except by way of the Sunnah. So with regards to establishing the legislation and the laws of Allah, then they're equal and they must be together. And they're not separated. And we'll not say this comes first and then that one. Rather, they are equal and one of them uh, complements the other and clarifies the other in this manner like this. So the Qur'an and the Sunnah are equal with regards to establishing rulings and laws. As for the virtue and the nobility, then the Qur'an has a, a rank higher because it's the words of Allah. It's the words of Allah. As for the Sunnah, it's the words of the Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You understand the difference? Uh, that's clear? So the virtue, the Qur'an, is higher than the Sunnah. But with regards to establishing rulings, then the Qur'an and the Sunnah are equal. Even some of the Salaf, they would say, Al-Qur'an ahwaju ila sunnati min sunnati ila Qur'an. That the, the Qur'an is more, is more need to the Sunnah and because the, the, the Sunnah clarifies the Qur'an. The Sunnah clarifies the Qur'an. Many things that will be mentioned in the Qur'an that uh, are general. And the only way to understand the details of that are in, are in the Sunnah. That's what they mean by that. That's what they mean by that. Yani. So the, the, Quran, the Sunnah clarifies the Qur'an, specifies the Qur'an, 
brings detail to that which is mentioned in general in, in the Quran. So they, they come together. They come together. They're equal with regards to rulings, with regards to legislation, with, regard, with regards to Islamic law. Understand that? Alhamdulillah. Is Chick fil A halal? Is Chick fil A halal? Allah He says, Ariyoma Uhila Lakum a Tayyibatu, Utaam Muladina Utul Kitabi Hilu Lakum. Allah He says, Today we have made permissible for you that which is wholesome and good, and likewise the food of the people of the book has been made permissible for you. Ibn Abbas, he says, The meat that is slaughtered. So the meat that is slaughtered from the Jews and the Christian is made permissible for us. So that's the original ruling. That's the original ruling, that the food, meaning the, the meat that is slaughtered, and he from, the, from the, the cattle and the chicken and the likes, that is slaughtered by the people of the book, the origin is that it is permissible. That it is permissible. So to say that it's haram requires a proof. To say that it's haram requires a proof. Uh, Allah, Allah he says, do not, do not describe with your tongues lies saying this is halal and this is haram. To fabricate lies against Allah. Verily, indeed, those who fabricate lies against Allah, they will never be successful. They'll never be successful. So the origin with regards to this affair. The, mood, the, the food of the people of the book is that it's, it's lawful for us. Even the Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentioned that there was some new Arab who accepted Islam. So they don't know if they said the name of Allah in the food or not. Sammu antum wa kulu. You say Bismillah and eat. You say Bismillah and eat. And that was with regards to the food of, uh, of, the, of the Muslims. But the point is that likewise, the food of the people of the book is allowed for us. So this is all halal. What is halal? What is slaughtered by a Muslim is halal. What is slaughtered by a person of the book is halal. That's the origin. That's the origin. You understand that? That's the origin. Unless somebody knows for sure that this piece of meat right here is, is, was slaughtered to other than Allah. Or that this piece of meat right here came from an animal that died uh, before being slaughtered. And the likes like this, then you cannot claim that it's haram. And this is something that we should be very, very, very careful about. For example, I'll say, uh, to now ask you a question. Somebody uh, goes to... Uh, two brothers. One of them, he, he, goes to, uh, he, he goes to get the chicken from the Muslim market. Another brother, he goes to Walmart and gets the meat from Walmart. What do we say? Which one is halal and which one is haram? Huh? Both of them? Both of them are halal. That's the origin. In America, there are, are almost close to 40 or more Islamic slaughtering plants. Plants that slaughter chicken specifically their plants every plant has a number all over america they're different plants they slaughter islamically the the the, the meat and they distribute it all, all over the world literally all over the world and all over america and all over the world some of the meat that's slaughtered this chicken that's slaughtered in the name of allah by a muslim is distributed and with the name halal on it other uh, meat is distributed without the name halal on it from those who distribute that meat, Tyson. Tyson. Not every Tyson bag of chicken is from those plants, but some of them are. So a brother, he is, was in charge of those plants. And he gave me a list to every plant number that slaughters halal chicken. And I checked with him. And I went to Walmart and I found a number of bags. I went to Kroger, I found a number of bags. In this state and in Oklahoma when I visited my family. And I showed him the bag. This, this number here is according to the number he gave me. And I said, look, 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 this is in the Walmart. He said, yeah, yeah, I know the brother who slaughtered that. I, he knows his name. <laughs> he knows the man's name. The Muslim brother who's, who said Bismillah and slaughtered this particular chicken. He knows the man who works in that plant. You understand? So there are some, my point is now there's some chicken in Walmart, in Kroger, that's slaughtered by a Muslim. And it's halal. In Georgia and in Oklahoma, I verified both of them. <laughs> you understand? Not all of the chicken there. You can't say everything from Tyson or everything from Walmart. La. You have to look. There's a bag. On every bag, there's a, a P number, a plant number. So that brother, he knows those plants. Rather, they're under his care. My point is so that we know this is dangerous. Somebody might say, oh, you got that at Walmart. It's haram. 
And maybe it's that one that was slaughtered by our brother that he knows. You understand? So, so, so this is very dangerous. To, that's haram. That's a ruling from Allah. That's a ruling from to say that's haram. But this one is slaughtered in the same place that one's slaughtered from. Literally. Literally. So to be, to be careful about that. If a person wanted to say, uh, you know what, they're shubha. You know, they, they did some research about the, the slaughtering plants. And they say this and that and this and that. Right? The, the, the American slaughtering plants. They said that well, they did research and they found out this is how they do it or that's how they do it. So now they have doubts. Huh? Until you can verify that for this one that's in front of you, you can't say anything. Huh? You can't say halal, you can't say haram. Don't do that. What you can do is be like, you know what, I'm not going to eat that. I prefer not to eat that. This one from Walmart, I, I'm not, I prefer not to eat that. This one from Chick-fil-A, I prefer not to eat that. You can say that, alhamdulillah, but you can't say that it's haram. Again, this goes back to talking about the religion of Allah. We understand that? So we can't say, oh, that's haram. Meaning that's impermissible. If you do that, you're sinning. If you do that, Allah is angry with you. If you eat that, then, then you're, you're disobeying Allah. No, you can't say that part. You can't say that part. So the best one that, that he could do is be like, you know, I'm not going to eat from there. If he did that, alhamdulillah. But he can't blame those people who eat from there. Likewise. Because the origin is that it's permissible. You understand? So if a person, he wanted to eat from that, this is allowed for him in the religion. And it's not even advised to go into details. And it's not even advised to go look, ask, how did you slaughter that? How did they, how did they do that? Whether what is advised is to eat the, the meat and say, Bismillah. If it's slaughtered by a Muslim or slaughtered by a Jew or slaughtered by a Christian, you don't go into great details. How did you do this? And what did he say this? And what plan did it come from? And how? You don't, you don't do that. You just say, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah. The religion is easy. Don't make it hard for yourself. Uh, the point is that we shouldn't uh, say this is haram or this is not permissible because wallahi it might be sometimes really halal meat right there bought from Walmart bought from Walmart it's, it's possible you understand that? it's possible I've identified that verified that yani, uh, very clearly so we should be careful about saying that this is halal and this is haram and the likes like that there are so many questions and it's getting late and I feel bad if I don't answer all of them but um, I'm going to make another day, inshallah. What do you think? Huh? Huh? Because there's some very important questions about marriage and about parents and about knowledge. And these ones um, are going to require for us to be here at least 30 more minutes or 45 more minutes. So maybe it's kind of late, but we don't really have the time now. So we'll talk to the Imam, inshallah, and then if we have the chance, we put it in the in the telegram.